Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On September 3rd, 1967, something in Sweden referred to as Dagen H and also H Day occurred. Following a radio countdown at 5 a.m., all motorists in the country started driving on the right hand side of the road. Now, this may not seem strange, but the day before, <laughs> they were all driving on the left hand side. This was a major change for that country. Another change occurred in this year, and it happened to be in the NFL. That at the time may have seemed insignificant, just like when you listen to this little introduction. But as we jump into part two of our interview with Timothy P. Brown, we find out it had long lasting ramifications. And it all revolves around the Ice Bowl. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is December 31st, 1967, and we are at Frozen Lambeau Field. And I hope you packed yourself some hand warmers and all those other things. Get your hot cocos and maybe some beverages that we can't talk about necessarily right now. Got to keep yourself a little bit warm because it's a cold one out there, folks. In fact, it was a little bit below freezing, and that would be an understatement to say that it was a little bit below freezing because the temperature... According to the Pro Football Hall of Fame's website, said it was 13 degrees below zero. Think about that. That is cold. I mean, we're episode, this is released right before 4th of July. We're not talking about anything even close to that. But we all know why we are here. The reason is because this is known as the day that the Packers beat the Dallas Cowboys in something called the Ice Bowl. And last week, We happen to leave it off right at this moment with this week's guest about to tell us how the field goal posts had a rule change for a play that could possibly just transform how Bart Starr would be immortalized and then Jerry Kramer makes it into the uh, Hall of Fame. (laughs) Wait, all these things over a rule change? Field goal posts? What are you talking about? But that's what we're going to get into. Before that, We got to speak about last week, because if you haven't listened to the first part of this interview, which this is part two, then you need to mash the pause button, go back, listen to part one with Timothy P. Brown. He is an author of two football history books. And in this interview, we talk mostly about how football became football, 150 years of the game's evolution. And you know it, we left links for his books and also more information on Tim's website over at the show notes which you can get to through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com, which now takes you on over to my page on the Sports History Network, the headquarters for your favorite sports yesteryear. This is a network at the very early stages. So if you know of a podcast or another type of show that you think should be on the network and be affiliated with us, or maybe you're looking to start your own show, could be a history podcast about sports. It could be about your favorite sport, your favorite team, or even a league. Just go ahead, hit us up on the website over at the contact page. But for now, let's get back into how football became football. Speaking of the field goal, I did see another photo, how you kind of broke down the play, the ice bowl game with Jerry Kramer's block and the change in that. How did that field goal 
post change impact that play? Until so traditionally the the goal post um, and a couple colleges still use it had two posts instead of what's more common now is there's a single post and it's kind of a gooseneck style or a fork style slingshot style so a single post that kind of curves forward and then the the, the crossbar and the uprights are you know then position position over the goal line or the end line now. So that's what everybody had until there was a guy in Canada who was mad because um, he lost the bet when a play uh, occurred right over one of the goalposts. And I can't remember it, remember if his team won or, you know, made the touchdown or didn't, but one way or another, you know, the defense was able to leverage being against the goalpost to prevent the score. And so he was having lunch uh, with a guy who was a former NFL coach and was coaching one of the Canadian teams. And um, he ended up playing with his fork and he looked at him and was like, hey, this is, a, we could do this. And so the two of them got together. They created the new goal post, the, what I think they called it the tele, telepost. Um, but anyways, it's the, the single post style. They got the NFL to agree to implement those in 1967. Well, the ice bowl happened in 1967. And if you look at photographs, and I've, you know, I've got a photograph in, in the book of it, that play would have been either right atop or real close to one of the posts, one of the goal posts, the left goal post uh, for the offensive team, had they not changed to the, the new style of goal post that year. So Knowing that ball was there, would the, would the Packers have called a different play? You know, instead of Bart Starr sneaking behind Jerry Kramer to score and win the ice bowl, maybe they would have gone with a sweep. You know, who knows? Uh, but it's just one of those interesting things that, you know, here again, just changing the, the style of the equipment impacts play calling. So you're saying as a Detroit Lions fan, I should take my DeLorean back there and I should tell that guy, don't change the rules because I don't want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, as a Packers fan, cause I grew up in Wisconsin. Oh no. <laughs> um, I, I don't think the DeLorean going to help. I think this conversation is <laughs> going to have to be over. I wasn't aware this was the, uh, the, 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 the case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to grow up like when Lombardi and the Packers were just kicking butt. And so uh, maybe that's why I love football. I, that was going to be one of the questions generally anyways, is like, what got you into football? What was your, your origin story there? Yeah. You know, I, I just, I grew up in an athletic family. Um, you know, three, three of my brothers played college football. Uh, my sisters were college athletes. You know, so it just, you know, it was just something that was just always there. It was like breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it just just always loved it, loved participating, and and then you know the Packers helped <laughs> the Badgers. The Badgers didn't help very much back in those days, <laughs> right? Yeah, but uh, helps now. Being a Packers fan, and like you said, growing up in the Lombardi area, must have been pretty sweet. I mean, I can't relate myself to anything other than I keep going back to Barry Sanders. Maybe I should quit hanging my head on that, but that's all I have for the most part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's it's tough anytime you know if you're a fan of a particular team and they're not very good consistently you know that that makes it tough so uh you either have to find a new sport or a new team <laughs> right yeah but but you know having lived here in uh, the detroit area for you know 20 some years now um there are a lot of loyal loyal lions fans i don't understand it but you know <laughs> we got knocked on the head too many times that's their burden <laughs> so speaking you you mentioned that it was actually a uh, kind of a real change or what have you because of a Canadian Football League team. What are some of the other rule change or rule differences between the Canadian Football League and the NFL? Yeah, so I, I just um, it's funny because I just yesterday I just released the second article on my on uh, on my blog about Canadian uh, rules. And so one of the things that I think uh, Americans tend to think, well, why do these goofy Canadians? Why did they, you know, bastardize our glorious game and change the change the rules? Uh, why couldn't they just play American football? 
And, you know, if you look into it, you find that about, you know, probably the bulk of the differences are because the Americans changed the rules, <laughs> not, you know, not, not the Canadians. And so for instance, in, uh, uh, you know, American football was once three downs to gain five yards. And so in the 1905, 1906 crisis, during that time period, Walter Camp went up to Hamilton, Ontario to watch a game and Canadians were playing a game called Canadian rugby at the time. It was much, much more rugby like than, than uh, American football. Um, but they, you know, they did have downs and distance. And so they, uh, their rule, because they wanted a more open game was you had to go, you had three downs to get 10 yards. And so that influenced camp in recommending three yards to go or three downs to go 10 yards in 1906. And that's what the Americans adopted. And then, you know, a couple of years later, they switched to four downs to get 10 yards. But, you know, at the time, the American field had a 55 yard line, just like Canada does. You know, uh, there's, uh, you know, a number of other, number of other differences like that, but it, there's, you know, I, th I think the bulk of them really, it was Americans changed the rules um, independent of, of the Canadians. So, you know, we're really, we're the enemy when it comes to that. Right. Yeah. We're the ones always trying to be uh, on one side, you could say innovative or on one side, you could say, you know, um, troublesome trying to change the rules. So speaking of that, what were some of the rules that maybe went to the final vote, but didn't quite come into fruition, something that we just never know about? Yeah. So there were um, two, two kind of goofy rules that you would, um, you, you'd not expect, but um, and maybe there's more than two, but so one of the quick ones, there was proposal um, instead of going from zero to 10, 20, 30, 40, one guy proposed, he was a coach at Arizona. He proposed, let's number the field from zero to 100 so that he just thought it would be easier for people to understand what yard line it was and how long the games were. Um, that never really went too far um, for a long time. Uh, the feeling was that the that the game was supposed to be in the hands of the players, not the coaches. So, despite having professional coaches, they wanted the players to control the game, and so coaches could not communicate with their with their team during the game. You know, for for quite some time, um, a substitute who came in could not communicate with the team for the first play that they were in, just so that you couldn't send in plays, right? So. Um, so those are the, the kinds of things that um, were kind of goofy. And at one point, they they proposed having a 12th player on the field who would be essentially the play caller. And then he'd back away and not enter. You know, he, he wouldn't participate in the play, but he'd be a student, a player who would call the plays. So it would be different from a coach calling the plays. Right. So that never, you know, that never went anywhere. A another one that it, you know, I think kind of a couple of fun stories is when they first started numbering players, you know, they really did that because as you got bigger and bigger crowds and bigger and bigger stadiums, fewer fans knew the individual players and they were further away. So it was, and they started wearing helmets. So you couldn't tell who was who. So they started numbering players so that people could understand, you know, who's who. And so there were some coaches who opposed that because they didn't want the opposing scouts and other people to, you know, they thought it would help them. So there were guys who uh, just to kind of screw with everybody, um, they put their teams out there wearing Roman numerals, Minnesota put their teams uh, just for one game, but they put their team out there with four digit numbers. And there's, you know, there's an image of, of that team, you know, a guy being tackled in the end zone, wearing a, wearing a four digit number. Another one that occurred, when they were first kind of in the late forties, when they were transitioning to um, wearing a number that associated with your position, you know, there were, well, like we assume that centers should start with a five and guards with a six, et cetera. But initially they were like, okay, should it be the first number or the second number? Right. That, that is associated with the position and other people also looked at it Um and they wore alphanumeric numbers. So ends, the starting left end would be E1. The starting left tackle would be T1. The backup 
tackle would be T2 or T3 because T2 would have been on the right side of the line. So anyways, there's, uh, that actually came back in the late 50s. LSU went a whole season wearing alphanumeric numbers. So it just, um, it's one of those things like you look at our current numbering system and you think, well, of course that's the way it should be. But it really, you know, there's really no reason that we number the way that we do. It could have been alphanumerics. You know, why not? Yeah, that alphanumeric, and I saw that in the the photo too. Would they go game by game? If it's, say, a quarterback now is not the starter, how would that work? Yeah, so, um, yeah, potentially they could have. Um, you know, I mean, early on, people didn't associate numbers I mean, numbers weren't as important as they are now, you know? Uh, so like Red Grange was the first guy who had his number retired. So, you know, and that's really kind of when that association or loyalty to your number came. So yeah, it, it could be that they switched it from game to game early on the early numbering, it got switched from game to game. Uh, but then, then later it became you know, pretty, more, a bit more regulated. So the, the difficulty that even when LSU did that and, I think it was 58 or 57. They, they used the numbering system on offense, but on defense, they would switch from a six man front to a seven man front or whatever it may have been. And the numbering system didn't make sense anymore. So they, they didn't even try to number. I mean, they still wore a, an alphanumeric on defense, but it was based on whatever their offensive position was. Yeah. It's just something that, Again, we we kind of take for granted, and I'm just always okay. That number means that's my player, that's my fantasy football guy, or whatever. And you've been in football somehow, some way for quite some time, whether it's player, fan, coach, and now researching the book. What would you say from all of that experience, and then through your research, really like took you back and just said, okay, this is something that I wish would come back, or something that you're like, man, I'm really glad that this made a big change. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think, well, the, the number one issue would be opening up the game to African-American players. You know, I, I, that was, you know, I think as a, you know, I, I grew up in the North, I've lived in the North my whole life. And so I, you know, always understood that if you were black, you weren't going to play football at a major, you know, state university in the South. Um, and I guess I had this notion that, well, you could in the North, right? But even in the North, it was pretty, there were, it was few and far between until well into the sixties. You know, most teams would have, they might have two or three or four black players, but pretty much it was, it was all white. Texas was the last all white team to win a national championship in 1969. And then in the seventies is when things really, you know, switched and started switching pretty quickly. So, you know, if you just think about the, the state of the game, and uh, um, the number of of you know just incredible players that have um, that have been in the game since the '60s, you know, who happen to be uh, African American. It's like look at what we look at how much they missed. <laughs> you know, so pe- people of earlier generations, how much they missed by not allowing those guys to play. And what do, what do you think were some of the major? linchpins or turning points and make, making that, um, I guess you could say justification happen. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, I, I actually do think, uh, football and sports in general, were both kind of a, a cause and an effect of, of that change. So, um, it, it, it could not have occurred without broader social change and awareness and just all of the civil rights movement. But I also believe that, um, you know, young kids, if they're watching baseball or football and they see they see Jackie Robinson or Hank Aaron or whomever it may be. Uh, and I think the same thing can apply to the, you know, the, the arts. Um, if you see somebody who you admire and you love their play and they're on your favorite team, they're Barry Sanders, you know, uh, it's hard to not. You know, it's hard to not love a guy like that, right? And so, um, and then, you know, it just seems unreasonable for that 
person or people who look like him to not have access to any other kind of role in society, right? So I, I really do think that football and sports could not have changed without broader social change. But I think, you know, a lot of people argue athletics and the military actually were, you know, two of the places in, in society where, you know, things desegregated earlier and whether you had the same opportunity or not, uh, you know, I don't think you did, but things that options expanded. And so I, you know, I think the, I think it's both it's cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And someone who had to deal with that at the very beginning of the NFL, but before the NFL and going to a Carlisle Indian school, Jim Thorpe, why did you choose him for the cover of your book? I chose him for probably three reasons. One is that I was fortunate enough to hire a cover artist, Stuart Williams, who chose that picture. <laughs> so um, I was, so on the one hand, yes, I approved it and everything, but he's the one who came with that image. Um, interestingly, I actually went to him with a different image from the same game taken by the same photographer, but of a Georgetown guy rather than Carlisle. So anyways, so number one, it's the, the graphic artist uh, chose that image. Um, and I just liked it. I thought it was, it was great. And it, so part of it, I think it's just a very clean, simple image, but the, you know, when you talk about the kind of the, the racial or ethnic issues, um, it's just an interesting thing that Carlisle and a couple of other Indian schools, Haskell in Kansas and Sherman out in California, you know, they were able to play, they played the Ivies, they played the big 10, they played, you know, they played people and nobody thought much of it. You know, I mean, they were oftentimes were kind of what we would call now look at and say, well, that's kind of a racist or ethnic slurs uh, being used in describe, you know, sports writers used slurs to describe the Indian teams. But nevertheless, they were out there on the field and playing and beating those guys. And so it's just kind of, it was kind of an interesting for me, a juxtaposition, I guess, of, you know, why was it that the world at the time as football was developing, why did why did society accept playing uh, what they called Indian schools at the time, but not the historically black colleges and universities? I wonder how much that had to do with because it was founded by the uh, American government versus Pop Warner. I don't know what the whole timeline there was. Yeah, I mean, I think that so part of part of the justification um, or part of those schools with Carlisle being the most prominent. They viewed uh, the athletes playing football as as, an, as a way to Americanize them, you know, to take them to kind of instill American values and um, the American perspective as opposed to the Native American perspective. So, uh, and I, you know, that was not just football, but athletic, athletics in general, but football in particular. Yeah, and I'm looking at this book again with the, the cover on it. Uh, how can you not say that that's a football player right there? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm going to Canton and seeing his statue there when you just just taking a picture. Obviously, you know, he played a big role in the foundation of the NFL and at the very beginning. With that being said, I'm going to give you an impossible task, if you will. Could you give me your Mount Rushmore of four individuals when you were researching this book that you think really played a big role in the 150 years evolution? Let's throw it. Walter Camp, I think probably Pop Warner. I mean, he, he was just a, a real significant innovator. I mean, he created the single wing offense, double wing offense, uh, the bootleg. So th there's a lot of things he did, and he he coached in the east on the east coast. He coached uh, you know Stanford and you know etc. on the west coast. So I would say he'd be uh, second one. I, I got to go with. Uh, probably John Rydell as a third. So most people wouldn't know who he is, but, you know, Rydell helmets, shoulder pads, cleats. Um, he, you know, he invented the, or he, well, his company invented the plastic helmet. Um, and then they were the first ones to create a commonly used face mask. So I just think that that uh, equipment has had a tremendous impact on the game in terms of the, the safety of the game, despite, you know, the, despite the problems the game has, 
equipment had a has a huge impact. And so I, I think Rydell has to be up there. Uh, I'm probably going to uh, be mad at myself for trying to figure out, for not coming up with the, the third uh, or the fourth one uh, immediately. I, I'll just throw out the name George Varnell. I, I don't think he's one of the top four, but he represented, he's a guy that played at U Chicago and then became an Olympian. Well, he was an Olympian before that, but anyways, he became a, a sports writer and a big official uh, for many years uh, out on the West Coast. And I think people underestimate the, the impact of officials and, and officiating on the game and how that has transformed over time. And so, so I guess I, I'll, I'll put him out there for right now as kind of a nod to officials and, and officiating and how much that's changed them. Yeah, again, like I said, I understand that's a near impossible task, especially when you're, you know, you have s- the book again is like a tank running through the hills and <laughs> trying to run through all of those pages to figure out who's the most important. I think that's why it's uh, beneficial for the listeners of the show when they read the book to make their own assumptions, because everybody has a different perspective of what was the most important. Like you said, you had your top 11 rule changes. Everybody is going to have, you know, maybe Five of them are the same, but then they'll have some differences in there. Uh, speaking of personal, what what are some of your favorite football moments of all time that you were able to witness? Well, so the ice bowl <laughs> would would certainly be uh, would certainly be up there. You know, I, I think you know I'm I'm a Badger. I'm much more of a college football fan than a professional you know, football fan. So uh, you know, some of the Badger. Rose Bowl victories. We haven't been as fortunate to get victories on our last uh, four trips there. But so, you know, the, the, the Badgers first Rose Bowl win uh, in, in you know, more rec- recent times, you know, surprising. It was a surprise win. So we'll, I, I would definitely put that probably up there with number two. Going back to, so again, being a Lions fan. I've never experienced us going to the Super Bowl. I wonder if it's worse <laughs> to be a fan that never gets to experience going that or like the Buffalo Bills back in the what was it the the early 90s or whatever going however many times in a row and losing it like like which one's worse? <laughs> uh I'm sorry to tell you this but I got to think being a Lions fan is worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and just one of these days my my goal for them is that they win the Super Bowl before my grandpa passes on to the next one. So Hopefully that's coming up here anytime soon. Um, the books, again, going back, it's such a long book. There's a depth research. There's so many things that you had to go through as far as also, I'm sure, fields of friendly strife. Uh, what advice would you give to yourself if you could go back and tell before writing the books? What would you have said? Yeah. Well, so the I released the book about three weeks ago. and. Since then, you know, I've still been publishing uh, new articles on my blog. And in researching those things, I've found, like, I just was doing research on this George Varnell. I was doing research on Canadian football and its background. And so I learned a bunch of things that would have, I would have changed what I wrote in the in the book had I known those things uh, three weeks ago, but I didn't. And so I think the biggest, you know, kind of my my takeaway with that is to just say, you know, you know what you know at the time. And so you write based on that and just don't worry about the fact that you're going to find new information. You know, so I've got a bit of a perfectionist streak in me. And so I probably could have put the book out a bit earlier had I not said, okay, now I I have to find this picture to, because I really need to find a picture of X because it illustrates the point. And so maybe spend a little bit less time finding the perfect picture or reading one more article and just accepting the fact that I know what I know at a, at a given time. So um, having said that, I think it's a better book because I knew more. Or in certain cases, I found I found a picture uh, that just kind of illustrated a, illustrated a point. So um, like Varnell, part of the reason I raised him is I found him wearing the referee's black and black and white striped shirt, right? Those didn't always exist, but he, the earliest picture I have of a referee wearing one of those shirts is a picture of him wearing one in the 1927 California Stanford game. 
Yeah, it's back in the day. I used to see them. They looked like they were painters working for uh, Billy Willahan or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So originally, a lot of them would wear their letter sweaters because they. And if you looked at old newspaper articles, they generally show the school that the that the referee was associated with because it, it kind of demonstrated their objectivity. You know, they weren't associated with the two teams playing uh. the game. Um, and then, then they, then they tended, um, and it really, I think began more in basketball, but transferred over to football that they'd all wear, they'd wear all white uniforms with a bow tie and maybe a derby, you know, hat. Um, so, and then, you know, there was a guy actually here in Michigan, a guy who was a professor at, at, uh, Eastern Michigan university. And he was the one who developed the, the black and white striped shirt to avoid confusion with players. Hmm, Okay. So speaking of, we talked about this earlier, my, uh, maybe one of my DeLoreans, I'm going back to 1968 and that championship game. But if I gave you the virtual keys to my DeLorean, you could go back to any point in NFL history, uh, preferably a moment you weren't around for. So you could be a fly in the wall. Where would you go? Um, Yes. Well, you said NFL. Uh, and football history. Yes, you're more of a college fan. Any point in football history? It would be 1906. You know, just to kind of be able to. So, I mean, if I was in a position to influence things, it would be to, uh, you know, get them to, tr- you know, try to get them to understand that um, they were restricting the passing game far too much w- with the early rules, and to. You know, it's just one of those things that there, there's a lot of rules that have been put in place that have unintended consequences. Like we talked about earlier with the unlimited substitution, they didn't expect to occur what occurred. But there's a lot of other rules where they were trying to make they were trying to make changes, try to improve the game, and it just it takes a while for coaches and players to understand the new opportunity and the changes changes in plays and schemes that they have to make to take advantage of a new rule. Right. And so, so just to be able to say, Hey, if you could get rid of these restrictions on passing, or at least just to be able to say, Hey, this is going to be the best way to throw the ball, (laughs) you know, the overhead spiral or overhead, yeah, overhead spiral, which again, they didn't figure it took them a while to figure it out. No one had ever, tried to do that before so you know it's so obvious for us today that that's the way to throw the ball we can't even think of a different way to do it (laughs) right right i mean have you seen anybody in the past 30 years throw the ball a different way yeah good luck throwing it underhand it's going to be batted down every time yeah yeah so i mean it's just one of those where uh you know just to be able to tell them hey you're going to open up the game it's going to be safe for all those kinds of things if you if you take advantage of this thing called the forward pass and, and really utilize it you know, to its full full extent. If you were able to talk to Teddy Roosevelt during that time frame, what would you ask him? Yeah, so Teddy, I would um so his role is kind of interesting. Just I think people kind of overestimate how big a role he played. Um he, he certainly had an influence and he more than anything just brought it brought attention to it. I mean, but there had been a huge groundswell of you know the need to change the game. So with him, um, I probably would have a conversation about foreign policies as opposed to football. (laughs) Um, But, you know, the, uh, yeah, you know, I think, yeah, with him, with him, I mean, he was, he he loved football. He was a big believer in it. And and for a lot of kind of this muscular Christianity thing, this this toughness idea. So I'm kind of, I'm struggling here to think of a question to to ask him on, on a, Football basis, you know, I guess I probably would just try to get a bit better understanding of of what it was that he admired about the game, you know, so kind of get him to go beyond this toughness thing. And, um, you know, it took a long time for, the, you know, Walter Camp was the same way. It took a lot of time for those guys to accept moving the game away from, you know, the run it up the gut and power oriented football and kind of moving it in some ways back where it came from, you know, back to an open game, which rugby, you know, still is. So just maybe try to understand his mindset a bit in terms of what attracts you to this smash. You know, it's like, 
two teams playing goal line defense and offense all day long. <laughs> you know, that, that just wasn't as fun as what we now know uh, the game to be. Yeah, I think it'd be interesting just to ask general questions of, like you said, like what draws you to this or what was your reasoning for that decision for just anybody in history? Because it's had such an impact. Like the forward pass, let's just use that as an example. That 1906, I know we hi- we kind of hone in on that with all the unfortunate deaths and such. And it's just, there's so many things that have improved since then. Is there any other words or wisdom information you'd like to give to the guests of the show? Yeah, I, I guess I just, you know, hopefully the things that we've talked about, you know, people will find interesting. And so, you know, I think my intent, um, intent of the book was to kind of draw the the big pattern of what happened in football, but um, to just also get people to maybe understand um, and pique their interest, I guess, in terms of imagining the game when certain things that we just think are so central or so obvious, you know, imagining the game when it wasn't there. So what was the game like when the center still snapped the ball with his feet as they do in rugby rather than with his hands, you know, what was the game like before referees had whistles? You know, there was a long period of time when referees use horns rather than, or nothing, you know, to, to stop play. So we think of the whistle as well, obviously it's always been there. Well, no, it hasn't. And so it's things like that. Penalty flags, huddles. There's, there's so many things like that. That uh, you know, just become you know, they're just traced as part of the history that's discussed in the book. You know, also get into just silly things like why are quarterbacks called quarterbacks and halfbacks halfbacks and fullbacks fullbacks. You know, and it just had to do with the way that the early T formation. You know, how people aligned in in early football. The fullback was the guy who was farthest back. The halfback was kind of halfway between the fullback and the line of scrimmage and the quarterback was a quarter of the way. So, I mean, that's where it came from, but you know, a lot of people we've played the game or we've watched the game all our lives and never stop and kind of think about how did it, how did certain things start? How did they enter the game? And so that, you know, for me, that's some of the fun stuff and hopefully it's of interest to to your listeners. And uh, if they're interested enough, then, you know, they can find the book out there on Amazon. Yeah, and definitely there's, if we were to talk about everything in this book, it, we would be talking until four or five o'clock tonight. I mean, this is where we started at 10 in the morning. So I just wanted to reiterate that to the listeners of the show that this book is an in-depth look at how football became football, 150 years of the game's revolution. And we will leave links to the book on the show note. It's If the listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where would they go? Yeah, I mean, it's really the the two books that I've written and then fields of friendly strife.com. And if you, uh, I'm also on Twitter and, and Facebook. So on Twitter, I'm at F O F S. And so if you are interested in kind of tracking the blog and the things that I write, every time I publish a new article, I, I post it out there on Twitter and, uh, you know, with a link and same thing on, on Facebook, you know, uh, you can find me as Timothy P. Brown at, you know, with Fields of Friendly Strife being the, um, the thing you can probably search for on, on Facebook as well. So, and then again, there, there's whatever, 40, 50 different postings out there. So you can read through a couple, see if you're interested in looking at it further. If you are, that's great. If you aren't, go pound sand. <laughs> 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 yeah, then you're not, you're just not very smart. <laughs> or you're a Lions fan. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. I had, I didn't put this back on on purpose. I just realized it. That's my general go to sweater. So, is there, what about the future? Do you have any plans to continue working on books or anything like that? You know, I, I haven't identified uh, another topic for a book. I think that's, um, you know, for me, the two that I've written just kind of emerged. You know, the, the topics kind of crossed my path. And I got interested enough in them to, to pursue it. And so for me, it's probably going to be a function of, we'll, we'll see how this, how this book does just in terms of popularity. Is there enough of an audience for it that uh, warrants uh, more work? So, but I, you know, for sure, I'm going to be continuing to, to do the blog 
And um, I just, I think it's fun. And, you know, I just enjoy kind of doing the research, coming across some old image and trying to figure out what it, what it is that was going on in that, in that particular image and why, you know, why they're dressed like that, why the field looks like that, whatever it is, you know, the, I just find that history, you know, fascinating. Yeah. And I'd say that's the best place for the listeners of the show to continue to get more content from Tim Brown. Not that Tim Brown, but this Timothy P. Brown. Yeah. yeah. I did not win the Heisman Trophy. <laughs> there you go. Again, not that Tim Brown, because he did not win the Heisman Trophy, but nonetheless, a very informative interview with the author of both How Football Became Football, 150 Years of the Game's Evolution, and Fields of Friendly Strife. Now, I hope you enjoyed this interview, and speaking of the Ice Bowl and the rivalry between the Packers and the Cowboys in the 60s and 70s, well, I have another My Football moment for you. This one comes from Mark Morthier. Take it away, Mark. Hello, old school sports fans, and welcome to My Football Moment. My name is Mark Mortier, and my favorite football moment happened on January 16, 1972, when the Dallas Cowboys finally won the big one. I was about two months shy of turning 10 years old. My older brother and I had a favorite football team, the Dallas Cowboys. That day, the Cowboys were playing the Miami Dolphins in Super Bowl VI. Tulane Stadium in New Orleans was the site. The temperature was 39 degrees when the game started. And by game's end, it was 24 degrees. It's still the coldest Super Bowl ever played. The Cowboys had just won nine games in a row, including a 20-12 win over the powerful Minnesota Vikings in the divisional playoff, and a 14-3 win over the talented San Francisco 49ers in the NFC Championship game. We knew Dallas was an outstanding football team, and they were favored to defeat the Dolphins, but we were still pretty nervous. Would this finally be the year? It would be the sixth year in a row that the Cowboys were playing in the postseason. In 1966, they lost a heartbreaker to the Green Bay Packers, 34-27 to in the NFL Championship game. One year later, they lost yet another heartbreaker to the Packers, 21-17, to and what would later become known as the Ice Bowl. In 1968 and 69, Dallas would lose in the playoffs to the Cleveland Browns. Then in 1970, they finally made it to the Super Bowl, only to lose to the Baltimore Colts on a last-second field goal. They became known as the team that couldn't win the big game. With many of their players approaching retirement age, this might be their last chance to silence their critics. Dallas led at halftime 10-3 and increased their lead to 17-3 by the end of the third quarter. My brother and I were starting to think they might finally win the Super Bowl but we weren't ready to celebrate quite yet. In the fourth quarter, Cowboys linebacker Chuck Cowley intercepted a Bob Greasy pass. Three plays later, Roger Starback found tight end Mike Dick all alone in the end zone. Dallas cruised to a 24-3 victory. It wasn't a very exciting game for the average football fan, but for Cowboy fans like my brother and I, it was a long-awaited victory. We celebrated all night long. And unlike most Monday mornings, going to school wasn't so hard because we couldn't wait to brag about our Cowboys. That's my favorite football moment. What's yours? Thanks for listening and God bless. How about that? Finally tasting sweet victory. And I tell you what, if you like Mark's story style, well, you can go ahead and check out some of his articles and such over on the network. Mark is our latest partner of the Sports History Network, the headquarters for your favorite sports yesteryear. And if you yourself are interested in contributing to the network with either an article, podcast, video, or something else related to the history of sports, and we're really looking for some more beyond just football, because that's what we have right now, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com slash contact. We're hoping to continue to build this community, and we want to make this dedicated to reliving, retelling some of the most interesting stories of sports yesteryear. That's all sports. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. 
We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.